Okay, so let's get started with the last seminar of today. So tomorrow we start at 9.30. Uh, so it's a different uh, schedule than today. And uh, so last talk of today is Anton Arnold uh, from uh, Vienna. He's going to speak uh, about the entropy method for hypercoercive and non-symmetric Fokker-Planck equations with linear drift. So, Anton, Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, many thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation, particularly to Francesco uh, who uh, enacted with me and uh, arranged everything. I should start saying what I'm presenting here is joint work with my former PhD student uh, Jan Erb and with my postdoc uh, Franz Achleitner. Uh, so what I'm going to speak about is uh, degenerate parabolic equations and in the spirit of the first talk this morning by Laurent, the question of quantifying the large time behavior, quantifying the convergence rate towards equilibrium or in other words or in parallel to that the spectral gap of uh, these equations. So let me start with putting up the equation that I'm going to talk about. So it's the Fokker-Planck equation that we have here for the function f of position x and time t. I'm only going to speak about whole space problems. Uh, in this equation up here, I have a diffusion matrix D, which is constant in x, and the main feature is that I assume it's degenerate, so it's only positive semi-definite. Then the second term that appears here in this Fokker-Planck equation is the drift term with again a matrix C that is constant in X, and then the drift matrix is just multiplied with the position vector X. And uh, my goals during this talk will be to discuss First, as an introduction, uh, existence and uniqueness of a, unique, um, of a steady state for this equation. And then in the main part of the talk, I want to discuss the large time convergence to this steady state, possibly with sharp rates. And I want to give a rather complete theory for these equations with, uh, under the assumption that the matrices C and D are constant in X. So let me uh, put up an example where such type of Fokker-Planck equations appear in kinetic theory, uh, for example, from plasma physics. So what uh, was the uh, variable x on the previous page is now the pair x and v, x being position, v being velocity or momentum if you prefer. Uh, so here we have a space, phase space probability density f uh, say non-negative, and on the left-hand side, we have the Hamiltonian part of uh, this evolution. So here, the free transport of this uh, function f, and here the influence of some given external potential, capital V of x. Think of a potential that grows towards infinity, for example, quadratically. And then on the right-hand side, we have the dissipative part of the evolution, so here we have a diffusion part, and here we have a drift or friction part. And uh, note that this uh, dissipative part here, these derivatives that appear on the right-hand side, only are derivatives with respect to the velocity variable, and not with respect to x. That will bring in this uh, degeneracy that I'm going to speak about here. Uh, for this equation, you can write down a steady state of this exponential form here with uh, velocity squared and here this uh, potential can just plug it into the equation and uh, to verify that this is the steady state. Uh, so let me just uh, show you the connection of this kinetic Fokker-Planck equation to the Fokker-Planck equation that I had on the previous slide. You can just rewrite this equation up there in this matrix form so the first term that appears here is this degenerate diffusion term. So you see here you have this degenerate diffusion matrix here and this parameter sigma corresponds to the diffusion in velocity direction. There's no diffusion in position direction. And then all the other terms, this one, this one, and the last term are then just 
brought into this uh, vector here, uh, which was called the drift uh, vector on the previous page. And if you assume for a moment that this external potential capital V would be quadratic, then uh, this second vector here would be a constant matrix multiplied by XV. So then it would be exactly in the structure from the previous page. So for this situation, say with a quadratic potential, you could argue concerning the large time behavior that you can write down explicitly the Green's function, which will then tell you what the exact and sharp decay rate is. However, if this potential is not quadratic, then you won't have the Green's function and then you will have to resort to other methods. And that is somehow the motivation for what I'm discussing here. So here's the outline of my talk. I will start defining the notion of hypocoercivity that is related to these degenerate Fokker-Planck equations or degenerate evolution equations. And I will give you prototypical examples to illustrate what this notion means. Then I will give you a short review of the standard entropy method. And with the standard entropy method, I think of the spirit of the talk uh, this morning where there was no degeneracy involved. And uh, then I will show you the necessary modifications if you want to include degenerate problems. At the very end, I will give you a glimpse of a motivation why this whole method, this modified entropy method works. So let me start with the example that Laurence also showed you this morning, the standard Fokker-Planck equation given here in uh, n space dimensions. So this operator uh, uh, appearing here on the right hand side is a symmetric operator on the weighted L2 space where the weight is F infinity to the minus one, F infinity just being the standard Gaussian. So the standard Gaussian spans the kernel of this differential operator. So for this operator, you verify in two lines is that it is dissipative. So this inner product in this weighted space is non-positive for all functions in some domain of this operator. Uh, minus this operator is also coercive, or in other words, has a spectral gap. That means that this inner product is bounded below by the norm of the function squared. Whenever you are in the orthogonal of the steady state, that's the Gaussian. So that's the easiest example in this spirit. So as I told you before, I want to discuss here Fokker-Planck equations of this form with the main feature that the diffusion matrix is now degenerate, so only positive semi-definite. So in, in this case, you verify very quickly that minus this operator is not coercive in the sense of the previous slide. So this gave the motivation to uh, Cédric Villani to come up with the following definition of hypocoercivity, uh, which is a notion that describes the large time behavior or the exponential decay in those situations where you don't have coercivity. So here we will use two Hilbert spaces. So first, our differential operator L is considered on some space H and curly K uh, let denote the kernel of this operator. And now we consider some smaller Hilbert space, H tilde, which is uh, continuously embedded in the orthogonal of this kernel. Just to give you a vague idea at this point, think of the larger Hilbert space of some weighted L2 space as, as we had it on the previous page. And think of the smaller Hilbert space as some weighted H1 space. In many examples, this will be close to the correct setup. So then this uh, differential operator L or minus L is called hypocursive on the smaller space whenever there exists such an exponential decay rate. So you need two constants, a decay constant lambda, which appears here, and the multiplicative constant C that uh, appears here in front, which typically will be larger than one. 
So let me just give you an illustration of examples that on the one hand may be coercive and on the other hand are not coercive but at least hypocoercive. So let's again go back to the simplest example with the standard Fokker-Planck equation that we saw this morning. So here in the standard Fokker-Planck equation, uh, we know the unique steady state. And this steady state can somehow be seen as a balance of two mechanisms. On one hand, the first term is a diffusion. So here I show you a cartoon just in two space dimensions. Diffusion wants to spread mass away from the origin towards infinity. On the other hand, we have drift. And with this sign here in front of the drift term, this drift will move mass to the origin. So then we have a balance between these two mechanisms. And the steady state appears somehow as a balance of these two mechanisms. So now let's look at a degenerate example. Here in the degenerate example, diffusion matrix is singular. And assume for a moment that these red terms in the drift matrix are not there. Assume that omega is 0. So then on the right-hand side in this equation, I have, again, my standard Fokker-Planck equation, but only in the x1 direction, which means in the x1 direction, I have the equilibration just as on the previous page. But in the x2 direction, I not, no term there. So there is nothing happening in the x2 direction. So of course, there won't be equilibration in the x2 direction. But now we switch on these two red terms. And these two red terms just uh, bring about a rotation in R2. So this rotation then mixes the good directions with the bad directions. The good directions are those where you do have this diffusion and equilibration and bad direction where you don't have it. And on the previous page, I forgot to say, so we know, and uh, Laurent showed that in his estimates, that the sharp decay rate towards the steady state is 1. So now in this example here, in the x1 direction, we have this equilibration with rate 1 no equilibration in the x2 direction. Now, when you start to mix, it's plausible that your resulting decay rate will be the average, 1 half. This is, of course, no proof. Uh, the real story uh, will be that you look at the drift matrix C that appears here on the right-hand side, which has the coefficients 1 minus omega omega and zero, and you look at the eigenvalues of that, and when omega is large enough, this means when you rotate your system quickly enough, then the real part of the eigenvalues uh, will be equal to one half. And this then will give you this sharp decay rate of one half in this two-dimensional example. Uh, in the case that you are uh, rotation just uh, the rotation parameter is just the limiting value one half. Then this matrix C here is similar to a Jordan block, and then you lose an epsilon in this decay rate. So let me uh, illustrate what is happening here uh, from one more side to give you an idea what uh, is happening here. Here is again the Fokker-Planck equation from the previous uh, page. And I just put omega equal to 1 as an example. And for a moment, I just want, uh, let's cancel this diffusion term. And let's just look at this first order transport equation, uh, uh, which uh, has this uh, divergence here of this drift term. Then you can solve it, of course, with characteristics. And here I uh, show you one characteristic curve in R2. This is this blue spiral. That's then a solution to this simple linear ODE here. And we will see towards the end of the talk that looking at this characteristic term really gives us information also about the Fokker-Planck equation. So what I'm interested in here is the convergence towards the steady state on the level of the uh, characteristic equation, I'm interested in the convergence of these characteristic curves towards the origin. 
So let's have a look what this blue spiral does. And here on this uh, graph, I also show you some circles around the origin. These circles are just level curves of the Euclidean norm. So if x should go to the origin, I want to see how along this flow, along this blue spiral, how the norm, the Euclidean norm decays. What we observe is, whenever this blue spiral intersects or cuts through the x1 axis, then we have a strict uh, decay of the Euclidean norm because it uh, intersects this uh, level curve with a non-trivial angle. But whenever the blue spiral intersects the x2 axis, then it's tangent to this level curve. So there we don't have a strict decay of the Euclidean norm. Uh, there we lose the strict monotonicity of the decay. So then on this ODE level, one question to better understand the decay would be, well, let's introduce a different norm instead of the Euclidean norm, uh, rather this one, uh, where we put instead of the identity matrix, another matrix P uh, with level curves that are these ellipses. And if you introduce this norm, then this uh, blue spiral will always intersect these curves with a non-trivial angle. So then you will always have decay uh, or a strict decay of your norm. And one of the questions, of course, will be, well, how do we find this matrix P? How do we find the best matrix P? And this is closely related to this paper of Dolbo, Moore, and Schmeisser. So let me first uh, make some assumptions on the coefficients that appear in my Fokker-Planck equation. So first, and these coefficients are the diffusion matrix and my drift matrix. So if you think back of this uh, hypocoercive example that I've shown you, there we had a diffusive direction and a non-diffusive direction. And the drift matrix C had to mix these two directions. Therefore, it's plausible to make the following first uh, assumption that no subspace of the kernel of the diffusion matrix should be invariant under C transpose, because then you would lose this mixing. And exactly this condition will also guarantee that this operator L is hypoelliptic in the sense of Hermandel. So since this is the case, we have the following convenient properties for the existence and regularity theory. Assume that you have an, a one initial condition, your solution will be instantaneously C infinity, or if you have an uh, L1 initial condition that is not negative, instantaneously your solution will be strictly positive. I will need a second condition. The second condition requires that my drift matrix C here is positively stable, which means that all eigenvalues of this matrix must be strictly positive. So this relates somehow to the fact that here in this drift term, you have somehow a confinement potential. Confinement potential such that in the drift term, mass will be moved towards the origin and not away from the origin in all directions. So somehow the punchline or the combination of the two assumptions is if you have for this Fokker-Planck operator hypoellipticity plus confinement, you have hypocoercivity. Again, hypocoercivity means you have the chance to show exponential convergence towards the steady state. Um, so now some remarks concerning the existence and uniqueness of the steady state. Here's again my equation. Here we have the following simple theorem. There exists a unique steady state, and the steady state is of this Gaussian form. It's a non-isotropic Gaussian where the covariance matrix K that appears here is the unique solution of this matrix equation. So C and D are input matrices in this equation, and you have to solve it for the matrix K. Such an equation is called continuous Lyapunov equation. There are simple algorithms, even in MATLAB, where you can compute K. So you have the K, the unique K at hand. Uh, now that we have 
our unique steady state and this matrix K, I can simplify and normalize my problem. So I make the following coordinate transformation from the X variables to Y variables. If I make this transformation, my new steady state is just the standard Gaussian and my diffusion matrix turns out then to be just the symmetric part of the drift matrix. I can make one more simplification and now rotate my Y coordinate system such that the diffusion matrix is diagonal and uh, singular. So from now on, I'll assume that uh, these uh, normalizations are done, then computations will be slightly simpler. So let me now give you a short review of the entropy method. And uh, with entropy method, I just mean in the language of this morning's talk, deriving entropy or deriving the entropy, entropy dissipation inequality. Uh, here I am back to a simple Fokker-Planck equation, simple in the sense that the drift term that appears here is the gradient of some scalar function A, uh, and here still I keep a constant matrix D, which at the moment should be regular. So we have already seen this morning if an initial here, if you start with an initial condition that is L1 and uh, non-negative and say normalized to one, then you will keep all these property du properties during the evolution. Uh, for this equation here, you can write down explicitly the steady state. It's just the exponential of minus this potential appearing here. You just plug it here into these two terms and to verify that. Uh, moreover, you can rewrite this Fokker-Planck operator in this slightly simpler form uh, using the steady state, and you verify again that this is a symmetric operator in this weighted L2 space. So the weight is again the inverse of the steady state. And for concerning this potential A of X, think again, it's a confining potential growing, for example, quadratically. Uh, what I want to use for understanding the large time behavior will be relative entropies, which should act or should be used as Lyapunov functionals, just as we saw this morning. Uh, so here I will use a slightly larger family of relative entropies. So these relative entropies are somehow uh, a non-symmetric distance between two probability densities, F1 and F2. And here it's defined with this integral uh, where I use scalar functions psi that I call entropy generators. So these are functions from R plus to R plus with the following uh, properties. Here's a sketch of such functions psi. They should be non-negative. At the point one, it should be zero because when uh, F1 equals F2, you want the distance to be zero and it should be convex, plus there's some technical assumption between the second, third, and fourth derivative uh, of these entropies, and I'll show you later on how this technical assumption appears. So concerning examples of such relative entropies, first of all, the logarithmic entropy that we have seen this morning, or power law entropies, uh, where the powers can be between one and two. So the admissible relative entropies uh, due to this technical assumption are somehow bounded below by the logarithmic entropy and bounded above by the quadratic one. So we can use entropies in, within this range. Uh, we've also seen already in the morning uh, how, what the time derivative of this relative entropy is. So here I consider the relative entropy of my solution, the solution to this Fokker-Planck equation compared to the steady state. So here on the right hand side, we have minus the relative Fischer information. So what I denote here by capital I was denoted in the morning by capital D. That's the entropy dissipation. Exactly the same term. Now let me give you a brief review of the entropy method. So again, 
This is a procedure to show the entropy, entropy dissipation inequality uh, that we want to have in order to prove exponential convergence of the solution towards the steady state. Or another way how you could see that in the morning we saw that this inequality for the Fokker-Planck equation, the key inequality was a logarithmic Sobolev inequality for the standard or simplest Fokker-Planck equation. So another way how you could see what I'm going to review now is how can you prove more general logarithmic Sobolev inequalities for more general equations for more general entropies. So such an entropy method always proceeds in two steps. The first step is that you want to show the exponential decay, not of the entropy, but rather of the entropy dissipation. So assume that initially the entropy dissipation functional is finite, and assume for the equation that I had on the previous slide, so here the equation with this diffusion matrix, and this uh, drift potential, A, that these two input variables satisfy this so-called Bakrier-Marie condition. So here we have the Hessian of our potential in the equation that should be bounded below by the inverse of the diffusion matrix. At the moment, the diffusion matrix is regular, so this uh, makes sense. So under this convexity assumption, one can prove that the entropy dissipation, denoted here by a capital I, decays exponentially where the rate lambda one is related to this constant that appears there. I should mention that uh, this approach goes back to Bakri and Marie coming from probability theory. And in this work with Markovic, Toscani, Unterreiter, it was reformulated or represented in a, a more PDE language and such approaches have become very popular in the last 15, 20 years because they are very robust towards nonlinear perturbations or nonlinear modi modifications. So now the second step of the entropy method. What you really want to prove is the exponential decay of the relative entropy itself. So under the same convexity assumption, uh, of your potential in the equation with respect to the drift matrix, you have exponential decay of the relative entropy. And let me just give you a hint of the proof. Uh, in the proof, you first think back of how you proved the analogous inequality for the entropy dissipation, capital T, uh, capital I of T. So there, uh, you derive, in fact, such a differential inequality for the time derivative of the entropy dissipation in terms of the entropy dissipation. And once you have that, you integrate this inequality in time, starting at t going to infinity, and then you recall that capital I, the dissipation rate, uh, the entropy dissipation, is nothing but the time derivative of your relative entropy then you get the corresponding differential inequality for the entropy. And then Gronwald's lemma just gives you this exponential decay that you want to uh, have, plus some technicalities uh, with density, for example. So this was a review of the standard method. And now I want to show you how life changes when you switch from a symmetric Fokker-Planck equation to a non-symmetric or even degenerate Fokker-Planck equation. So this slide is probably the key message that I want you to keep from today, even if you don't follow all the technicalities. What I show you here in this plot is the relative entropy in, on this red curve as a function of time for the standard Fokker-Planck equation, for example, with the quadratic entropy which is nothing but the L2 difference of the solution to the steady state in this weighted norm. But the same thing would be true for the logarithmic entropy. So you see the entropy decays as a convex, nice convex function. You have this exponential decay. What else you would see here, this dotted curve, is the time derivative of the relative entropy, 
And of course, since the entropy uh, decays, this entropy dissipation is always strictly negative unless you have reached a steady state. So this is also a notion that was introduced in the morning with this strict entropy uh, framework. And this fact that the entropy dissipation is always strictly negative, uh, this makes it possible to have such a differential inequality between the time derivative of the entropy and the entropy. Now is here, uh, again, a plot, time uh, dependence of the relative entropy for this degenerate prototype, this two-dimensional example that I showed you in the beginning. So it does not decay in a convex way. It rather decays in this wavy way. Uh, and now let's look at this dotted curve here, down here. That's the time derivative of the relative entropy. And what is really bad is that the time derivative can be zero here, here, although we have not reached the steady state yet. So on the level of the relative entropy, it means you can have horizontal tangents to your curve. So we are outside of this strict entropic framework from this morning. So this means also that it's a priori impossible to have such a differential inequality between the time derivative of the entropy and the entropy. But this was how we proved the exponential decay. So we have to modify our approach. Uh, let me mention that this wiggly decay of the relative entropy uh, has also been known or is well known for more complicated examples. Here is a plot from a paper by Philbe, Muo, and Pareski from 2006 uh, for, for the inhomogeneous Boltzmann equation. So let's just look at this dashed curve where they plot the relative entropy with respect to the global Maxwellian. So again, you see this wavy decay with horizontal tangents, which is exactly the same phenomenon. So let's go back to the analysis. And what I want to discuss now is Fokker-Planck equations with a, a singular matrix D here. So as I said, the time derivative of the entropy can be zero for some states other than the steady state. And this implies somehow that uh, the uh, Fisher information functional that we have here on the right-hand side is not really useful for our large time anal analysis. And the, the reason why we have this problem that this uh, relative Fisher information, that's this integral here, uh, disappears for states other than the steady state is the fact that the diffusion matrix is only positive semi-definite because there are states F other than the steady state where the gradient of this quotient solution at some time over the steady state lie in the kernel of the diffusion matrix. And then it's already zero, although you're not at the steady state yet. So one remedy to get out of this trouble is to say, well, then let's just modify this functional a little bit. What was the problem here? The problem was the diffusion matrix. So let's just replace the diffusion matrix by a positive definite function, uh, matrix P. Then let's see if this gives us a better picture or a better tool to study the large time behavior. And the goal would be, as in the standard entropy method, that we want to find a differential inequality between the time derivative of this modified functional, this modified entropy dissipation functional, and the functional itself. And if we are able to find such a differential inequality for the good choice of a matrix P, then we have exponential decay of this modified functional, which is not intrinsically linked to our equation. However, this matrix P is uh, uh, a regular matrix, so it bounds from above our singular diffusion matrix D with some constant. 
So if this functional decays exponentially to zero, then also the true functional will decay uh, to zero exponentially. And this is what we want to have. So the main question is, how do we find this matrix P? And the answer uh, will be given by this small algebraic lemma, which uh, appears in th at first glance a bit disconnected from the discussion so far. So think of a matrix Q that is positively stable. So this means all eigenvalues have a positive real part. And assume that all eigenvalues that give rise to this minimum are non-defective. Non-defective means their geometric multiplicity is equal to the algebraic multiplicity. So let me uh, give you here an idea of the spectrum of such a matrix. So here I have the real and the imaginary axis. Here I have my critical vertical line with this parameter mu. And assume for this matrix Q, so I'm plotting here the spectrum of Q, assume on this critical line there are some eigenvalues, assume the matrix uh, is real, so eigenvalues will come in complex conjugate pairs. So it's, assume the, ma the spectrum looks like this. So the statement or the assumption up there is all eigenvalues on this critical line here should be non-defective. Then the statement is, there exists a positive definite matrix P, not unique, uh, such that this matrix inequality holds. Uh, let me just anticipate a little bit and put it into perspective what this matrix inequality will mean to us. This parameter mu or, uh, that appears there, which is defined by the matrix Q there, and in the end, we will have uh, in our application Q will be the drift matrix C. Uh, this parameter mu will be our exponential decay rate. And this matrix inequality will be, for our Fokker-Planck equation, the replacement of the Bakrier-Marie condition, of this convexity condition. So what happens if there are some defective eigenvalues on this vertical line? then in fact you lose an epsilon on your decay rate. You can still find matrices P to have this inequality, but you lose a little bit. Just a glimpse of the proof how to construct this matrix P in the non-defective case. Just take all eigenvalues, eigenvectors of the transpose of this matrix Q, uh, sum up these tensors of these eigenvectors, and you can compute and verify in two lines that this gives an admissible matrix P. I said from uh, before, this matrix P is not unique, but independently of P, you will always get the same decay rate for your equation in the end. So now let's come to the entropy method for these degenerate equations. Uh, and as I said before, the entropy method comes in two steps. First, exponential decay for the uh, entropy dissipation functional, and then the second step for the entropy, or the relative entropy itself. Here is our modified entropy dissipation functional, uh, which is an auxiliary functional with a matrix P that is, uh, that is obtained from the previous lemma. So here we have the following result. Uh, the uh, parameter mu is obtained from the drift matrix C uh, under some nice assumptions on the initial condition. Uh, we have exponential decay of our modified entropy dissipation functional if all eigenvalues on the critical line there are non-defective. If there is a defective eigenvalue, you lose an epsilon in the decay rate. There's one point that we should keep in mind uh, already at this point. The decay rate mu that appears here in the exponential is determined by the spectral gap of the, of the drift matrix C, which is in our equation. So let me give you a hint of how to prove that. So we have to compute the time derivative 
of the modified entropy dissipation. This is this functional S. And uh, this time derivative can be written as, two, as a sum of two terms. So in this uh, sign here, there's two to three pages of computations, which I skip. Uh, so first, we have a term here that looks very similar to the functional that we started from. So we have a second derivative of uh, the entropy generator psi, and here we have this quadratic form of the gradients of solution over steady state with some matrix in between. So here we have almost the same. The U is just a shorthand notation for this gradient solution over steady state. And we just have this combination of the matrix P, which was put in our functional, and the drift matrix C. But for exactly this combination of matrices, we have this algebraic lemma from before. So it is this point where I use now this modified bakri emery uh, condition. And if I use this inequality, I'm back to this functional S. So I have my differential inequality because this term here, this remainder term, has a sign. Therefore, I can throw it away. So let me add one more comment about uh, this remainder term. Here we have a trace of two matrices X and Y. Both of them are two by two matrices. The matrix X has this form. It uh, involves the second, third, and fourth derivative of solution over the steady state. So now we want this to have a sign. Therefore, we had this uh, technical assumption at the very beginning on a special combination of these derivatives. And here's this technical assumption. And for this matrix Y, which is some junk here, with Cauchy-Schwarz, you can also show that this has a sign. So this term is a remainder with a sign. So as I said, the entropy method always comes in two steps. First, exponential decay of the entropy dissipation. Secondly, exponential decay of the relative entropy. Let me briefly recall how we did that step in this, say, standard entropy method. We had a differential inequality for the dissipation rate, and then we just integrated it in time, and we were done. We cannot do that here, because this functional S is nothing intrinsic for our equation. It's not the time derivative of the relative entropy. So if we integrate it in time, we don't get the relative entropy. Uh, still, we have the following theorem. So under some nice assumption on the initial condition, we have here the relative entropy of your solution at time t with respect to the steady state is bounded by a term that decays exponentially with the same exponential rate mu as before. Uh, so here, and uh, this is what we wanted, exponential decay of the solution. Uh, so here, the whole line of inequalities. Uh, here we have the uh, modified Fisher information at time t, which decays exponentially. This is something we already know. So the question is only how to prove this inequality here. Uh, so let me anticipate for the experts here. This inequality here is nothing but a logarithmic Sobolev inequality or a generalization of a logarithmic Sobolev inequality. So how do I get this generalized logarithmic Sobolev inequality? Uh, in order to show that, I use an auxiliary Fokker-Planck equation. Here it is. Uh, it has a priori nothing to do with our equation that we want to study here. I cook up this equation the following way. I want to have it the same steady state as my true equation. So the G infinity should be the same as F infinity. Therefore, I put here the steady state into the equation. And I want to have it uh, the diffusion as a diffusion matrix, my positive definite matrix P from the functional. Then in this equation, my steady state is just the standard Gaussian by construction. This is a symmetric Fokker-Planck equation that I've shown you 
in my review at the beginning. So for the symmetric Fokker-Planck equation, the scalar confinement potential A of X is just this quadratic term. So the Hessian of this confinement potential is just the identity matrix, which can be bounded below by the inverse of the matrix P, because it's positive definite. So therefore, this auxiliary equation has an exponential decay uh, towards zero. And hand in hand with this exponential decay goes a generalized logarithmic uh, Sobolev inequality. Here it is. Here's this logarithmic or convex Sobolev inequality, which is an inequality between the relative entropy and this uh, functional S, this modified Fisher information functional. And this is exactly the term that we want to plug in here. So let me repeat, the equation G actually has nothing to do with my original Fokker-Planck equation. It's just auxiliary. And I use this uh, convex Sobolev inequality for each fixed point in time. And then ju just plug it in here to the original equation. And then I close this inequality. Uh, let me make one more remark. Why is this auxiliary function G the right one? Uh, this auxiliary uh, function G and this evolution equation the right one? Well, the modified Fisher information S is just the true entropy dissipation for this auxiliary equation. And therefore, this is the reason how the story matches. So where do we stand? We have here exponential decay of the relative entropy. This was my goal, so I could stop here. But I still have some, some more minutes. So this inequality is OK, but not nice in the sense because I have here exponential decay of the relative entropy, but I have to invest a higher order functional of the initial condition. Uh, here the S involves the gradients, and in the original entropy method, you just invest as an in information on the initial condition the relative entropy initially. So let's improve on that. Uh, and the way I want to improve here is I want to use parabolic regularization. Uh, it's a degenerate parabolic equation, but nevertheless it uh, regularizes. So in order to show you a regularization, let me briefly uh, discuss the a structural property of the equation. The Hermander order of my Fokker-Planck equation is an index M, a natural number, such that I have this matrix inequality. So let's pretend for a moment that the diffusion matrix D is positive definite. Then I don't need this pre and post multiplication with C. And the matrix D is bounded below by multiple of the identity, of course. But if the D is singular, then uh, M equals zero will not work. And you have to go higher up and add more of these terms until you get a bound below by this identity matrix. And the smallest index M such that you get this inequality gives you this index and somehow quantifies how complicated the structure is, how degenerate it is, and how many times you have to uh, mix good and bad diffusion directions, or in the Hermander notation, how many iterated gradients do you need to span your whole space? Uh, once you have fixed this index, then you have this regularization result that tells you, start initially just with a finite relative entropy, and then instantaneously with this inverse power law, you even get finite uh, modified Fisher information. Uh, think of this regularization inequality as a regularization from some weighted L2 space into some weighted H1 space. I should say uh, this regularization goes back to work of Hero. In the book of Cédric Villani, it was worked out for the quadratic and the logarithmic entropies. And here we have it for all entropies in between using the similar spirit of proof. So with this regularization, 
we can now show you the somewhat smoother result. So assume that this uh, index mu, which is the smallest real part of the eigenvalues of the drift matrix, so that's the spectral gap here, is positive. Then we have exponential decay of the relative entropy, and you only need on the right-hand side the initial relative entropy. Again, if you have defective eigenvalues, you, you lose an epsilon in the decay rate. So with all what we have already seen up to now, the proof is really simple. Here is the relative entropy at time t. This is bounded due to a convex Sobolev inequality by this modified Fisher information at time t. For the modified Fisher information, we've already seen that it decays exponentially. But I don't go back now until t equals zero. I leave a short initial time layer of length delta, and there I use this uh, regularization result to, bound, to get a bound on the right-hand side with the initial relative entropy. Uh, let me say that uh, the rate that we obtain in this way is sharp. This constant, this multiplicative constant C, not necessarily. So I motivated this whole analysis by the kinetic Fokker Planck equation. So let me get back to, to this kinetic Fokker Planck equation. Here it is. Uh, let me recall that the uh, steady state is this exponential term here. And in case that this given external potential capital V is quadratic, the exponential dec uh, decay of the relative entropy is completely discussed by uh, what we have seen so far. Uh, let me skip that formula. But if the potential is not quadratic, we need some, some more analysis and some more tools. And in fact, what I have shown you so far can be extended in some cases to more general potentials. So here, uh, I just show you the result in one dimension. Assume that your potential up there, the external potential, is a quadratic term plus a perturbation. A perturbation that is such that the variation between the second derivatives, so the maximum here, the maximum of the second derivative, and the minimum of the second derivative is bounded in some sense by the friction constant in the uh, kinetic Fokker Planck equation. Then we still have exponential decay of the relative entropy. The story is somehow like this. Uh, without this perturbation term, you have a certain decay rate, and then you can give up part of this decay rate and allow for a perturbation in the potential. So this is somehow the compensation that appears in there. And I should say it's, it's not a, say an epsilon perturbation, but you can quantify it in relation to a parameter in your equation. And let me also say again, in this perturbed setting, you don't have a Green's function anymore. So there you really need to use tools, as I've shown you here. So, so far I've shown you a modified entropy method that works for degenerate Fokker-Planck equations with a diffusion matrix that is singular, uh, which brought about a variant of the entropy method. So one question that one may ask is, well, let's try to apply that to Fokker-Planck equations that are not degenerate. And let's see if we learn something more. So here we have a Fokker-Planck equation in the same structure as before, but the diffusion is now not degenerate. But the equation is not symmetric. Not symmetric means the drift term is not just the gradient of a confinement potential. So there's this rotation contribution also included in there. You can verify that the steady state here is the standard Gaussian. And what we want to find is such a decay inequality, an exponential decay inequality for the relative entropy. So you want to find a decay rate, lambda, and the multiplicative constant, C. 
So at this point, we have two methods. We have the standard entropy method, and we have this modified entropy method. And we want to compare the results that we obtain. So the red curve is, again, the evolution, the time evolution of the relative entropy for this example. So you see, as before, there's this wavy decay. The equation here is not degenerate. Therefore, we don't have horizontal tangents. But we have this wavy decay. So let's first look at the standard entropy method. Here, uh, the unique steady state is the standard Gaussian. So we have a quadratic confinement potential. Its Hessian is just the identity matrix, which is bounded below by the inverse of this regular diffusion matrix. And then you get here a decay rate, which is known to be sharp. And let us call us now, it's the sharp local decay rate with a lambda that is equal to one quarter. What means sharp local decay rate? Well, if you start here at t equals zero, you have an exponential function here. Uh, you have a constant uh, that is one, and your decay estimate, this function here, is the blue dotted curve, and they are tangent. This is tangent to the true entropy function this red curve here. So in this sense, it's sharp at every point in time. But clearly, for large time, this is a very bad estimate. Then on the other hand, we have this variant of the entropy method, which gives us a sharp global decay rate in the sense of capturing the sharp envelope of this wavy decay. With a decay rate, uh, which is 5 eighths, which, which is clearly better. So, uh, and in this case, we can also show that at least in, in two dimensions, we always, always catch here this sharp envelope. So I have a few more minutes left. So, so far, this picture and the, the comparison of these two methods look quite, quite nice. There's just one question left is, why does this work? So, let me again give you an algebraic answer. And I want to base this algebraic answer on the following simple question. Let's compare the spectral gap of a matrix Q. Uh, let's think of a matrix that is, again, positively stable. And let's compare the spectral gap of such a matrix, non-symmetric matrix, with the spectral gap of its symmetric part. So that's one half the matrix plus its transpose. Why do I raise this question? Well, uh, in fact, the entropy method works mostly with quadratic functionals. And here, I don't mean so much the quadratic entropy. This is a special case. I rather mean the Fisher information or the modified Fisher information uh, function, which is quadratic in terms of the gradient of solution over the steady state. And in, when computing the time derivative of this functional, we get here matrices which are not symmetric. And therefore, uh, when trying to estimate these terms, we will only see in the estimates the spectral gap of the symmetric part of whatever matrix is in there. So let me come back to the question. Let's compare the spectral gap of a matrix with its a symmetric part. So there's first the following simple lemma. For every matrix Q, the smallest eigenvalue of the symmetric part is smaller or equal to this value mu. But typically, it's strictly smaller. So what does this mean in this uh, plot here? So here, Let's say the spectrum of the matrix Q is contained in this vertical strip. We have a non-symmetric matrix. Now, if I want to compare it to, this, to the uh, spectrum of the corresponding symmetric part, then uh, this spectrum will be typically contained in an interval that is larger. So that will be the spectrum of the symmetric part of the matrix Q which is, in the end, then our drift matrix. But this is bad news, because that will mean, in my estimates, 
that I will lose this part in the estimate of the exponential decay. And if I'm unlucky, uh, the situation is like this, and I cannot prove exponential decay. Uh, but there's a way out. Again, a very simple algebraic lemma. There exists a positive definite matrix P, which will give me a similarity transformation. A similarity transformation of my matrix Q with actually the square root of P. In such a way, of course, this transformed matrix Q tilde has the same spectrum as Q. But in such a way that when I now look at the smallest eigenvalue of the symmetric part of this transformed matrix, I don't lose on the spectral gap. I get exactly the same spectral gap. Uh, if there are defective eigenvalues on this line, I will lose an epsilon. So this means there's a similarity transformation that my original matrix Q, it's similar matrix Q tilde, and most of all, the symmetric part of this Q tilde have the same spectral gap. And this is what I want to catch for my estimates. So let me show you how this very simple algebraic result works. Let me get back to the drift characteristics, to the simple linear ODE that I've shown you at the very beginning. There, I told you, this was the story with the blue spiral and changing the Euclidean norm to a modified norm that was indicated with this red ellipse. And this modified norm was this quadratic form here with the matrix P. So let's compute the time derivative. If you compute the time derivative, you get here matrix C in and now I just rewrite this term in a crazy way. I rewrite it in a crazy way because this term here is just the similarity transformation from my previous slide. And here it's, it's transpose. So here I have the symmetric part or twice the symmetric part of the similarity transformed part. And the lemma from the previous side just told us that the smallest eigenvalue here is the smallest eigenvalue or the smallest real part from up there. So this part is bounded below by two mu. Well, if I use this, then I have here this simple inequality for this P norm, which gives me exactly this decay rate, two mu, which is the sharp rate. But this is only an ODE story. So the last question is, how is this simple ODE question related to my Fokker-Planck equation? Let me recall, I'm only interested here in Fokker-Planck equations that are non-symmetric. So you don't have a full orthonormal eigenvalue basis. But this Fokker-Planck equation has a surprising property. It has an infinite sequence of flow invariant eigenspaces of growing dimension that are orthogonal. So of course you have the kernel, and then above that you have a first eigenspace if you are in R2 of dimension two, which is orthogonal to the kernel. Above that you have a three-dimensional eigenspace, which is again a flow invariant and orthogonal to all the previous ones, and so forth. So, in the first eigenspace of dimension two, say, the evolution in that finite dimension space is exactly given by this uh, characteristic equation. Therefore, there this computation applies. If you go to the next higher eigenspace, there the evolution is determined by a tensored version of this ODE. And in the next one, in a triple tensor, uh, version of that and so forth. Therefore, this simple ODE determines the whole evolution of this Fokker-Planck equation and this shows us that this simple computation and this matrix P that appears here in the norm catches the correct behavior. So I'm already a bit over time. Let me just uh, summarize. I've shown you a modified entropy method for degenerate Fokker-Planck equations. First, with only linear drift terms. The key tool was to modify the entropy dissipation functional. 
Then I've shown you how to extend that to a kinetic Fokker-Planck equation where your potential is not necessarily quadratic. And uh, what we can learn from that story also for non-symmetric Fokker-Planck equations. And then uh, let me just uh, point out uh, for the case where eigenvalues here are defective, I've given you decay estimates that where you lose an epsilon in the decay rate. But actually, that's not the true story. Because if you think of ODEs, if you have defective eigenvalues, uh, your true behavior will be polynomial in time times an exponential. So here for the Fokker-Planck equation, of course, the story is the same. So the truth is you don't lose an epsilon in the exponential term. You rather get a polynomial, in the simplest case, quadratic or higher order. And this is a preprint with uh, Tobias Wörer, who is here, and Amit Enough. And here are some references where this method is written up. Uh, applications to kinetic BGK uh, models where you have a, a drift part and a reaction part. It's joint work with Fritz Leitner and Eric Kallen. So sorry for taking longer than planned. Thank you for your attention.